we human. Amen. Turn to leave your, in your scripture to Romans chapter 12. I'm just going to read the first couple of verses. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And you can say amen when you got it. Amen. Some of y'all be saying amen. I'm not waiting on that. <laughs> Look at the screen. <laughs> I ain't mad at you. All right. Romans 12, verse 1. Paul's writing to the church at Rome. He said, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He said in verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'm going to read that again because that's a lot of the context of my message tonight. Verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that means Paul's begging you, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, that's the bodies that you live in right now, this flesh that we have, we present them a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto who? God, which is your reasonable service. And verse 2 says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Tonight for our title, it's a little play on words, Altered by the Altar. Altered by the Altar. Praise God. Let's pray really quick and let's ask the Lord to help us here tonight. We want to open up our hearts and minds to receive from him today. Come on, if you could help me pray in Jesus' name, that would be appropriate. Heavenly Father, we thank you today, Lord God, that you've gathered us here tonight, oh God, to get fresh bread from this word. Lord, I pray that you help me to preach and to teach under the unction of the Holy Ghost, Lord God, that your word, God, should go forth and bring deliverance, Lord, that it should bring understanding, that it should bring revelation today, Lord God, that it should bring salvation, Lord. I pray tonight that you pour out of your spirit, Lord God, upon all flesh that are here today, Lord God, transform us by your word, that we should be conformed to your image and pleasing to you, Father, in everything that we do. We want your will to be done in this service, Lord, so we surrender right now. We open up our hearts and our minds to receive from you today, praying that your will would be done. We give you all the glory, we give you the honor, and we give you the praise. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody shout amen to the Lord. Come on, clap your hands one more time as you're being seated tonight. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. I feel good tonight. Anybody feel all right? Amen. Altered by the altar. One of the main themes in the gospel that we believe, teach, and preach is that of transformation. Transformation. Transformation is the idea uh, that the death on the cross gives the opportunity for us to be transformed right. to being like him. Amen. That was part of the message of the gospel. It's not just enough that we are sinners. He died so that we wouldn't remain sinners. Amen. 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 And so we see lots of statements in the scriptures that allude to this. First of all, Jesus saying statements like, you must be born again. He said things like, I'm going to give you life and that more abundantly. New Testament says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new crea uh, cre creature. Excuse me. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. Paul would say in Romans 6 that we're to walk in newness of life. John chapter 1 would say, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So it's one thing to come to God as you are, but that the expectation is once God is in the mix, you really shouldn't be staying as you are. You can absolutely come to God as, as you are. And when churches normally say that, they mean physical appearance, which is 100% right, but it's also your spiritual appearance, your, your heart and your mind. God wants you to come however you are, however dirty you are, however unclean you are and however sinful you are absolutely there are no barriers for entry when it comes to the house of the living God amen, amen. sometimes he has to meet us in the dirtiest of places with the with the worst and grimiest of sins and thoughts and minds and ideas and we thank God for that that he didn't place a limit on who could be available for this gospel it, it, it can save the homeless crack addict as, as best as it can save the, the rich man living down here uh, on Davis Island it, it, it doesn't discriminate in that manner However, in both scenarios, um, regardless of how much money you have or how well off you think you are, all of us need to be transformed. Because the idea is to make us like Christ. <laughs> 
That's what the Christian word means is to be like Christ. And in order to be like Christ, we must be transformed. Praise God. And I'm glad that God has the ability to transform us. It's one of the good selling points of the gospel, the fact that God can take the least of a man and make them one to the greatest thing in his kingdom. And he doesn't require us to really uh, come with anything that, that, that's going to be useful. He does all the work. Um, all the power of transformation belongs to him. And it's a wonderful thing to be whole. Because if you'll submit to the process, you'll find yourself being transformed into being somebody completely different after God gets done with you. Amen. You used to be doing one thing, and now you do another thing. You used to struggle with this, and now you don't. You used to be this way, and now you don't. And that's just, a, that's just a negative to positive. But even furthermore, there is fulfillment of his will once you understand. I stop living for myself, and I start living for God. I get all the fulfillment that comes with that. And so I know I'm assured that I'm doing the will of God because God has transformed me. Uh, today, I want to help you, however, to understand how transformation happens. And it happens at the altar. And so we've got to talk about the altar. It's a very popular term in Christian vernacular, I will say, but often a very misunderstood term. I mean, there's people that sing all about the altar and great songs, but really don't understand what it is, you know. And if, and if I tell you today, come to the altar, automatically we think of this, this area right here in the front of a church. And depending upon your experience in past churches, it may be a smaller area or a larger one. There may be little booths or things for you to kneel at, little benches up there for you to you kneel at. And when people say altar nowadays, we're talking about the front of the church, right right, right where the pulpit is and, uh, that's, that's elevated. But... Uh, in the Old Testament, the altar was a very different idea and concept. In the Old Testament, the altar was a place of sacrifice. It was a place of death. It was a structure that was normally built with wood or stones, um, and it used as a fuel either wood or coals. And the sacrifice would normally be an animal of some sort. It was very, very primitive if we were to look at this. Um, someone offering a sacrifice on an altar. If you saw someone doing this, you'd probably think there was something demonic happening. If you saw someone presenting something and offer and an, an, an sacrifice on the altar, it, it would look like a, a, a basin of stones with a fire on it and someone slaughtering an animal to throw the animal on there with their hands lifted, praising and worshiping and praying to, to a deity. Um, so if you came in this church and you saw that happening, you'd be like, what in the world have I stepped into? Uh, Y'all are looking cute now, but if you came in here and I had a, a big old box here and I had a lamb on that thing and there's smoke coming up in the air and I'm lifting my hands like, oh, yeah. blood all over the place and it <laughs> looks kind of creepy. It would probably look like something off of a scary movie. It's like, what kind of spirits is pastor conjuring up? But this is what God would have them to do in the Old Testament. It, it, it took on various different forms throughout the Old Testament, but the principle remained the same. It was a place of sacrifice. It was a place where you gave an offering, and it was a place where something died. It was a place of death. Normally in the Old Testament, it was also a very high place. You'll find they would build altars on mountaintops. They would build altars on hills. They would go to a very high place because what they were doing was offering something to God. So in proximity, they would bring them up into a very high place. There are lots of ceremony in the Old Testament uh, offerings that they would have to fulfill. God would dictate what they would offer. Sometimes it would be a ram, a bull, uh, or goat, or something like I know this is kind of boring, but you have to get this foundation to understand it. Um, they would offer all kinds of sacrifices. And a big chunk of Leviticus is just concerning those sacrifices and what God would have them to do. And that was a priesthood's job. They would stand before this brazen altar in front of the tabernacle. They would have these people bring various animals, lambs, bulls, and, and oxen, and all kinds of things. And they would cut them up there at the altar, and drain the blood at the base of the altar, and offer it up to God as a sacrifice. And uh, we see this as consistent throughout the whole Bible. As early as Cain and Abel, all the way to the book of Revelation, the concept of the offer, altar is present. Yet it is probably misunderstood, very much so. And we don't, thank God, we don't offer blood sacrifices to God today. 
I thank God that is not a commandment for us to follow. Otherwise, you might have to come in here with your favorite lamb or a dove if you were Jesus' family. They offered a dove at his dedication and circumcision. Um, they, you could come with some oxen or bulls, depending upon the time of the year or the type of sacrifice. And you would have to lay your hands on that animal and confess your sins over that animal. And then the priest right in front of you would kill that animal, drain its blood, and throw it up on what was essentially a glorified barbecue pit that was old, built out of wood but overlaid with metal. And it would smell good. <laughs> Uh, but it was a horrible picture. It was, it, it, essentially, the tabernacle was a slaughterhouse, y'all. Um, the works of Josephus, which was a Jewish historian right around the time of Jesus Christ, records that on Passover, they would kill 250,000 lambs. That's a lot of sacrifices, you know, because they got a lamb per family. So you can imagine uh, the, what, what that looked like on a, on, a, on, a, on a scale of a whole nation. We don't have to do that today. We don't bring animals as a blood sacrifice to God because Jesus fulfilled all of our blood sacrifice. When Jesus stepped on the scene, John said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Praise God. He was the sacrifice for our sins. He is a mediator to reconcile us to God. His bloodshed did what no other animal blood could ever do. It could completely remove our sin forever. See, the blood of a lamb wasn't powerful enough to get the job done. The blood of bulls and goats weren't powerful enough to get the job done. What it was really pointing to was that there would come a time where God would robe and make manifest in flesh to offer himself up as a sacrifice to pay a price for our sins that we ourselves could not pay. That blood that Jesus shed was the price for our sins. This is why we don't have to give account to our sins anymore. We've got the shed blood of Jesus applied to our lives in the waters of baptism. When we go down in the waters in Jesus' name, that blood is applied to us. So when he sees us, he doesn't see our sin any longer. He sees his blood, and therefore death passes over us. This is why Jesus said, I'm going to give you everlasting life. Praise God. Praise God. We ought to get excited. I think a little bit about the sacrifice that Jesus paid him. And, and, and maybe maybe the, the preaching, generic preaching of the cross and the gospel is not exciting to us anymore because we know it, but it really is the reason why we're here today. And that all that Jesus spoke concerning the altars in the Old Testament, he would fulfill at the cross. And so you don't see, after the death of Jesus Christ, much mention of blood offerings anymore. You don't read in the New Testament how we are to offer up a lamb for our sin. We don't read about offering up bulls and oxen on particular holidays. What we find now in the New Testament is the revelation that God had a different principle in mind, more than just bulls and goats and lambs for an offering. What he really wants is you. Hmm. See, we don't bring animals to offer blood sacrifices anymore, but the principle remains the same. He doesn't want an animal he wants you. I beseech you, Romans 12, verse 1, Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Huh. He doesn't want blood, but he wants your life. Why? Because the Old Testament tells us that life uh, is in the blood. Leviticus 17, verse 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar, to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. <clears throat> Aren't you glad you, being the sacrifice, don't have to shed blood today? Amen. This would be a very creepy service if I sat up here with a knife and said, all right, are you ready to shed blood today? <laughs> no, no, no. What was, he, what was the principle he was establishing? God just doesn't want you. He wants your life. Amen. He wants your life to be poured out for him. And the principle also remains the same, that he responds to sacrifice in the same way. Leviticus chapter 1, verse 9. But his inwards and his legs shall you wash in water, and the priest shall burn it on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, here it is, of a sweet savor unto the Lord. That term means that it smelled very good to God when that flesh was offered up on the altar. That means that God was attracted to the offering of they would put on that altar 
when sacrifice is made, God is attracted to it. So when someone is sacrificing for God, God is drawn closer to that sacrifice. I, I joke about this all the time. It would be like if someone's barbecuing and you're driving by and you smell it, you're going to be like, hmm. You know, your nose begins to lead you. <laughs> Praise God. And so when, when that goes forth, you're drawn to that smell. Well, God is drawn to our sacrifice in the same way that we would be drawn to that type of food. It turns out there is no better way to get the attention of God than to sacrifice and to give God what he's looking for. So then, God wants us to be changed. We should want to change. But the process for change comes by the altar. We cannot be transformed without the altar in our life. It is through this sacrifice of ourselves that we are transformed into his image. So we're going to talk about this today. Uh, I got three quick points for you today, and I pray that you pay, pay, pay close attention because this is, this is very important. First of all, transformation comes through sacrifice. Many people desire to change but lack the appropriate method to do so. In order to bring about something new, the old thing has got to die out. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, verse 16, No man putteth a piece of new cloth onto an old garment. For that which is put in it to fill it up taketh from the garment, and rent is made worse. The rent, excuse me, is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break and the wine runneth out. And the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Sometimes, as Christians, we get the idea or concept that we just want God to patch us up. Lord, just fix this on me, and I'll be good. I don't have to give you my whole life. Just fix this about me, and I'm good. I've even prayed that type of prayer before. Lord, just I know what my problem is. If you would just fix this, God, I got the rest. Help you, Holy Ghost. But Lord's like, no, we're not, we're not using patches to do this thing. Nor are we using putting this new wine in the old wineskin. And the concept is very simple. If you know anything about the fermentation of wine, they call it spirits for a reason because fermentation process releases gases and it will cause that skin to stretch and expand over time. And if it's old wineskin, the thing is already stretched out. It can't stretch anymore. It will burst. But the new wine skin hasn't stretched yet, so it would be able to withstand the pressures that that new wine or juice would put into it. Um, they would have understood that process because that's how they made wine. None of us have distilleries in here today, so <laughs> you might not know what Jesus is talking about. But essentially, he's saying he doesn't want just to he just doesn't want to patch up the old thing. You've got to be willing to be made completely new and get rid of the old thing. To let the old thing go. Mm, help us only go. This is stopping a lot of people's transformation because you want to keep a little bit of the old and get a little bit of the new and put it together to make just a better person of who you were. God doesn't want a better you. He wants a new you. Uh, I got scripture for this. We got to let some stuff go. Thinking, we got to let go. There's some actions we got to let go. There's some words we have to let go. Even deeds. All of this needs to be renewed by God. Ephesians 4, verse 17, it says this, with the Lord's authority, I say this, this is in the NLT, by the way, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Gentiles are anybody that's not a Jew, by the way, or in this context, also someone who hasn't been born again. But before you are newborn, you're hopelessly confused. Help us, Lord. It's humbling. This scripture is kind of humbling, so don't get mad at me. I'm just a messenger, Okay. Verse 18, their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have, look at this, closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame for they live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. Verse 20, but that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, verse 22, look at this. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. Let's repeat that. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. Everything, everything. Everything is on the table for God to renew. 
Nothing is off limits. And, and I know because sometimes we think we had some stuff figured out before Christ, B.C., if you will. And, and we think, well, Lord, we, I can keep this part of it. But, and God may, may let you keep some parts of it. I'm not saying it, but all of it needs to be on the table. All of it needs to be on that altar, and we'll let the fire of God burn up what he will. Right, right. Mm. Sometimes we keep some stuff off limits. God, I'll give you this, but I'm not giving you this. I'll give you this, but I'm not giving you this. But that, that, that's going to hinder your transformation process. So we've got to be willing to throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life. Look at this, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, this is just as important. Let the spirit renew your thoughts and hello. Praise God. So it's not even us that's doing the work here. We're just surrendering and allowing God to transform us by his spirit that he put on the inside of us. So at the end of the day, if somebody sees the end product, you still can't take the glory for it. You've got to say, this was the spirit of God. All I did was put myself on the altar. All I did was surrender my old habits, and I surrendered my old thoughts, and I surrendered my old attitude, and I let the Spirit of God teach me new things. So praise God. I let it give me a new attitude. Verse 24 says, put on your new nature. We have a new nature in Jesus Christ. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Transformation can only come through sacrificing and willingness to let go of the old. Secondly, we have to give God the acceptable sacrifice. You can't just give God what you want. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto who? Mm. That means he sets the parameters for this. He's the one that dictates what is acceptable, not we ourselves. And so we don't get to decide what God will accept. We've got to give what he wants. If we don't give what he wants, we will be rejected. This is one of the early stories we learned from Cain and Abel. that You cannot give God whatever you think is best. You must adhere to what he desires if it is to be accepted. Genesis 4 verse 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife. She conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she bare again his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. <coughs> and it came, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and unto his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Sometimes we're not getting anywhere with God. Because we're not giving him what he wants. Sometimes we're not getting anywhere with God because we're not giving him what he wants. I know the sacrifice may have cost you something, but it may not be what he wants. So we got to really take a step back and look at scripture to find out, okay, God, what is it you want from me? And this really goes in any kind of gift. If you give somebody, I don't care how much it costs you, if they don't want it. You know. Praise God. The issue is this. When you refuse to give God what he desires, it will produce sin and frustration. Because his countenance was fallen after God has said, I'm, I don't want that. And sin lieth at the door. Now, you know the rest of the story. I didn't have it here in my notes, but... He, he, he couldn't take it out on God. So he got jealous at his, you know, goody two-shoes brother whose, whose sacrifice was accepted. And God even told him, just do what is right and you'll be accepted. It's not like he didn't know. He knew exactly what to do. He just refused to give God 
what, what God would require. And because of this, he ended up taking it out on his brother and slew Abel in the field. God showed up a little later and said, where's your brother? He's like, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And God said, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries up to me from the ground. So what happens then, and this is, this is key, what happens when you refuse to give God the sacrifice he's interested in, your walk with God will be frustrated. Your countenance will fall. You'll be angry. You'll be, ooh, Jesus. You'll be discontent with your, and with your walk with God, and eventually you'll start to take it out on the people around you. You'll start to take it out on them because now your relationship with God is broken, so your relationship with man will deteriorate as well. Mm. See, a life of subpar sacrifice produces hatred, produces envy, it produces gossip, it produces lying, jealousy, and bitterness, even murder towards your brother. All of these are character traits that entered into Cain because he refused to give God what he wanted. The solution in this case is very simple. Just give God what he is looking for, no matter what it costs. God is asking you for a certain thing, give it to him. God is asking you for time, give it to him. God is asking you for whatever it is. We have to understand that nothing is off limits for God. Especially if we are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. So I'll progress here from that. Thirdly, this is a good one. People don't understand that the sacrifice is also a gift. I think we forget sometimes that the sacrifices to God are also our gifts back to him. We are offering ourselves to the king as a gift. This is what the scripture says, well, your gift will bring, make room for you. When you come into the presence of the king, normally they come in with a gift, say here. And that would grant you entrance. But now you are the sacrifice, you are the offering, and you're giving it to him. It is something that we are presenting to God in hopes that he will accept it and use it and consume it. See, there's a tendency for churches to devolve into a mindset of receiving. And this happens whenever we stop sacrificing. People are focused more on what they can get from the church than what they are giving. I'll say that again. People are focused on more what they can get from the church than what they're giving to God. They have a consumer mindset. When you start, stop sacrificing yourself, putting yourself on this metaphorical altar, your mindset is, well, what about me? What about my needs? What am I getting out of it? Who is fulfilling for me? And that's the opposite of what the altar represents. The altar represents sacrifice, and the very meaning of sacrifice is selflessness. Hello, somebody. So we really need to change our attitude and change our mindset of how we approach living for God and understand that it is actually better to give then to receive. Acts chapter 20, verse 35, Paul said, Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than receive. Why is it more blessed to give than receive? Why is it better than to sacrifice than to not? Well, because Paul would say in Galatians 6, verse 7, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life. So if you are someone who is continually sacrificing, giving yourself as a living sacrifice, God is not going to be mocked at that. He's not going to owe you anything. He's going to pour more out on you than you could have ever given him to receive in the first place. He's going to pour more out on him than you could ever give him in the first place. So those who are continually sacrifice and giving, uh, you'll find those are the people who are most satisfied with their walk with God. Those who are sacrificing are those who are most fulfilled with their life with God. Those who are sacrificing are those who have the joy that unspeakable and full of glory. Those who are sacrificing are those that normally have peace that passeth all understanding. Those who are sacrificing are those that have patience, praise God. Those who are sacrificing are those that normally have direction. 
those who are sacrificing can manifest the fruit of the Spirit because God is pouring back out into them in honor of their sacrifice. Because God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Praise God. It's a principle that God set in, in, in forth in this world. But if we refuse to sacrifice or give of ourselves, I'm not even talking about money in this context. I'm just talking about us, our, ourselves, then we will receive nothing. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, But I say, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So, I know this particular scripture in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, that's dealing with money. That's what Paul's talking about. But the concept goes beyond money. It goes into every area of our walk with God. It turns out that this is the case. And this is opposite of what we normally would think. You get out of this what you put into this. If you put nothing into it, you get nothing out of it. <clears throat> I know that that's countercultural because if you think about it, the way I talked about this uh, last Wednesday, uh, the Book of Acts church, most American model churches are designed really for a few people to do all the sacrificing and for a lot of people to just receive. And we judge ministries based off of what we receive from them. If it's to our liking, I will tell the truth. That's what you walk into a building, you say, well, I didn't really like that. And I didn't like that. And I, you know, I preach, he didn't really, he didn't feed me the way I wanted to be fed. I felt like I didn't. And, and these are honest criticisms in there. But it may not be the way the Lord designed it. It turns out you get out of it what you put into it. Jesus, which now puts the responsibility not necessarily on the preacher and the praise team and on the singers and on the ushers and the greeters and everybody. It really puts it back upon yourself. It's not what can I get from it. It's what am I giving into? Again, your sacrifice is also a gift to God. You're presenting your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And it's only after doing that that he can say, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? Why does my not mind need to be renewed? Because that's the only way, Brother John, that I can prove the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. So then, here's what an altar really looks like. An altar is a place of death where there's no physical blood, there's no physical skin or fat anymore. It's your will, it's your intellect, it's your emotions, sometimes it's your ideas, it's your choices, and you give it to God and say, here, Lord, kill it. As in essence, you're dying out. The irony is that we're called new life. I'm telling you, you got to have new death. Nobody would come to New Death Tabernacle. <laughs> you think we should rename the church as New, New Death? But that's, that's exactly the type of paradoxical uh, reality that the Lord would instantiate. That the, actually the way to life is. He even said that if a man will save his life, he will lose it. But if he'll lose his life for my name's sake, then he shall find it. Praise God. And I'm telling you here today. Uh, we need to grab a hold of this concept of the altar. So how in reality do we do this? Well, it's very simple. You do it through prayer. Now, you can pray and not have an altar. You basically, you because prayer is just communication with God. You can talk to God and God talk back to you and not change anything. In the same way you can talk to somebody else and have no intentions on doing anything different. It's just a conversation. But there are moments and times in your life where with God, I have an altar. I say, Lord, okay, you lead me, Lord. You guide me. Whatever your word says, that will I do. Whatever you say, God, that will I do. Paul said, I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not me. Christ in me. 
I'm still alive. I still have this body. That's why we're living sacrifices. We're still alive. We're still walking around, but I'm not controlling me. God is controlling me. Almost like we're little avatars. <laughs> I mean, not, not to that. That's kind of creepy, actually, kind of saying that. But it, it's, it's, it's the truth. We, we live by the direction of God. And that can only happen when you understand and have an altar in your life. So I want to encourage you tonight um, at this teaching. In your, in your, when you pray to God, it's great that you give God a prayer list things that you pray for, things that you're asking him for. But make sure on that list that you're presenting yourself to him as well. Presenting myself. Lord, I, I give you my mind. I give you my thoughts. I give you my ideas. I give you all of that. And we're alive. Praise God. At least I hope y'all are alive. If you, but we, can, we can pray for you today. If you, <laughs> which means that we have to make this choice on a daily basis. Because in an Old Testament sacrifice, if you brought a lamb up and I killed it, that lamb's not getting off of that altar. He's dead. Gone. But you, you get a choice tomorrow. What are you going to do? Am I going to live for God tomorrow? Am I going to live for God the next day? Am I gonna? That was what Paul said, I die daily. What does that mean? That means I submit all of my will, intellect, emotions, decisions, and ideas to God on a daily basis so that he can, he can get his will done in my life. And it's through that that God will transform you from the inside out. It's that process that allowed his spirit to begin to mold and shape your thoughts. It's that process that allows him to begin to speak into your life and give you clear direction. It's that process that he draws close to you because he's drawn to that sacrifice. He loves it when someone opens up their heart and their minds and it gives it all to him. It's the best way to get God close to you when you begin to sacrifice for him. And sacrifice in any manner, sacrifice in your time sacrifice in your, even in your money. People like to talk about money in church, but Jesus said, give and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaking together, running over. So you can't outgive God. Sacrifice in your emotions. Sacrifice in your talents. Hello. Sacrifice in your abilities. God honors all of that because he's going to pour it back out onto you and use it for the glory of his kingdom. So we have to remain a people that are baked and founded upon the altar of sacrifice if we want God to move in our lives. If we want to be transformed, we've got to be willing to say, Lord, here I am. Take me as a living sacrifice. John said of Jesus Christ, and I'll close with this. He said, I baptize you with water. But he that cometh after me is more than me, excuse me, was before me is mightier than me. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Well, that fire he was talking about was a reference to the Old Testament altar where the fire of God would come down and consume that sacrifice. So what John was saying is that we would be the sacrifice and the fire of the Holy Ghost would transform us. It would burn some things away, but it would purify other things. Amen. How many want to be purified tonight? How many want to be transformed tonight? Amen. I'm closing tonight. Let's all stand as we, as we pray here. And I just want to encourage you maybe to help you tonight. So you're you're, you're going to hear a lot. You need an altar in your life. Anybody ever heard that? You need an altar. You say, what in the world is that? Do I need to build something in my house and pray in front of it? No, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is in your private devotion to God, there should be a time in your prayer where you sincerely surrender your heart and mind to God. Where you don't have any preconceived notions or anything, and you just empty yourself out and allow God's will to be done in your life. And you'll find it, at least I find it, that's really a daily thing. So we've got to make it up in our minds that I live for God, Lord. Whatever you want to do. We sing a song that says, I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee I freely give. We want to surrender it all to Jesus tonight because really we belong to him. So why don't we pray here today that <coughs> we would be a living sacrifice unto him. And that... Through the altar, we would be changed and transformed. Come on, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you today, O oh God, for your love and your kindness toward us. You visited the ultimate altar of the cross at Calvary, Lord God. You shed blood, Lord Jesus. Your blood was drained to the base of the altar and placed upon the four corners, Lord. You visited the altar of Gethsemane where you prayed, not my will, but thy will be done. At that moment, you died out to even your own flesh, Lord. 
Father, we thank you today for showing us the path and showing us the way, oh God. I pray here tonight, Lord God, that you help us, Lord, to adopt that mindset, Lord God, of sacrifice. You came to be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Lord God. I pray that you help us tonight, Lord God, to present ourselves a sacrifice unto you, Lord. That first of all, Lord God, we would let the old thing go, Lord Jesus. We surrender, Lord God, all of our old mind, O oh God. We surrender, Lord God, all of our old thoughts, Lord Jesus. We surrender, O oh God, all of our old attitude, Lord God, and all of our old ways. And we accept the challenge here today, Lord God, of our complete surrenderance unto you, Lord. And I pray tonight that it would be holy and acceptable unto you, Jesus. Lord God, and I pray, O oh God, that you begin to transform us by your spirit, Lord God. I pray that the Holy Ghost, Lord God, would be strong in our lives, Lord. That through your word and through your spirit, you would begin to mold us, Lord. Begin to shape us, Lord God. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost burn out all sin, Lord Jesus. Let it burn out all iniquity, O oh God. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost burn up all lust, Lord Jesus, O oh God. Every sin of the flesh, let it burn up, Lord God. Every sin in our hearts, Lord God, let it burn up tonight, Lord Jesus. We surrender it over to you today, Lord God. And I pray, Lord God, that you would begin to purify us, Lord God. That you would make us new today, Lord Jesus, oh God. That you'd give us a clean heart, Lord God. Give us a right spirit, Lord God. Help us to walk in ways that are upright to you, Lord Jesus, oh God. That your voice will be clear in our lives, Lord. That direction would be clear, Lord Jesus, oh God. But we don't want to live ourselves, Lord God, but we want you to live through us, oh God. So I pray tonight, Lord God, as we present ourselves, Lord, that you respond in like manner, Lord God. Your servant James said, if we draw nigh unto you, Lord, that you would draw nigh unto us, Lord God. We submit ourselves to you today, Lord. We resist the enemy, Lord. And I pray that he flee from us, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that your spirit would be close to us, Lord God. Oh God, that you would dwell here in us, Lord. That you would order our steps, Lord God. That you would guide our tongue, Lord God. That you would clean our hearts, Lord God. That you would moderate our minds and our thoughts, Lord God. Let peace that passeth all understanding guard our hearts and mind, Lord God. Let there be joy unspeakable, Lord, and full of glory, O oh God. Let faith begin to rise up in us, O oh God, to believe you for anything, O oh God. I pray here tonight, Lord God, that you would shape us, Lord. That you would mold us, O oh God into your image, Lord God, that in everything that we do, Lord, we should be pleasing unto you, O God. Lord, we bring ourselves to this altar, O God. Pray, Lord, that your will would be done, O God. Change us, Lord. Mold us, O God. Shape us, Lord. O God, that when we are transformed, O God, we should become the sons of God. For you said that they that are led of the Spirit are the sons of God. Father, we're done with carnality, O God. Help us, Lord God, to walk in the Spirit, Lord, that we not fulfill the lust of our flesh, Lord God. We get rid of all carnality tonight, Lord Jesus. And I pray, O God, that you clean us up, O God. Make us holy and useful in your kingdom, O God, that your will should be done, Lord God. We want to be the light of this world, Lord. We want to be the salt of this earth, Lord God, to be effectively used in these last days, oh God. Therefore, Lord God, I pray that you speak through us, Lord God. I pray that your word would give direction to it, Lord God. Let it be a lamp unto our feet. Let it be a light unto our path, Lord God. Oh God, order our steps as of a righteous man, Lord God, that your will should be done, Lord. For we live today, oh God, not to save our own lives, Lord, but we lay them down for you, oh God. Oh God, that we might obtain life, Lord. You said in that more abundantly, Lord God. I pray, Father, as we do this tonight, you will respond, Lord. Let the fire fall on the altar. Let the glory of the Lord come down in this place. Let the Shekinah glory fill this tabernacle, Lord God. And let us be full of the Holy Ghost, Lord God, that your will should be done in us, Lord. We thank you tonight, Lord. We bless your name, Lord God. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and the praise. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, somebody shout amen to the Lord tonight. Come on and clap your hands to God tonight.